Okay, well maybe it's better that the videos stay a little shorter than 15 minutes each. Or maybe not. Sorry I kept getting interrupted. But let's uh, pick up where we left off. So, science fiction fables that purport to be about the creator really report cases of mistaken identity. If it really was Mega Big Incorporated that spoke to Moses, Moses was deceived, and the real life discovery that this Mega Big exists would be as traumatic as the discovery that one spouse was really a chem, a robot, a fairy. Not that the pious would need to abandon their belief in God, but they, that they would have to admit that much of their information about God came from a dubious source. Would a similar discovery about fairies similarly discommode believers? If most stories about fairyland, fairyland turn out to be somewhat distorted accounts of visits to the nearer stars or to an alongside natural universe, and regular contact gradually acclimatizes us to the alien ways, would that vindicate believers? Suppose Dawkins' gossamer-winged little persons turn out to be of insect descent, a rare variety of lepidopteran that has carried the death's head sort of camouflage an extravagant step further. Or suppose they are indeed extraterrestrials, whose partial resemblance to the human form is coincidental or sheerly illusory. Actually, we do not need to resort to fantasy. A good many stories about mermaids would at least have gained support from sightings of the manatee suckling her young at sea, and no one doubted that silkies and seals were, in some sense, the same. Are mermaids manatees? Are silkies seals? Is believing in mermaids just believing in manatees? Or is it merely believing a number of false things about manatees, such that any rational believer would be glad to learn the truth? We can, of course, vary the account. On one version, those who first saw manatees imagined that they were seeing women with fishes' tails and heard their singing. They named the creatures mermaids, and told as many foolish tales about them as they did of gorillas, lions, and their human neighbors. Increased acquaintance showed us our error. Mermaids don't carry mirrors, nor comb their hair, nor prophecy disaster, nor pro pull, pull personable young men down to their deaths, although they might look a bit as if they do, or as if they would. On this, the Kripkean view, Mermaids exist, although they have very few of the properties traditionally ascribed to them. Just so, Renaissance scholars could agree that Virgilius Maro existed once, although he was not the great magician that medieval fable painted. On the other version, sailors who already knew about mermaids at first identified dugongs and manatees with those fabulous beings. When they learnt their error, that these mammals have almost none of the traditional properties of mermaids, they decided, being good Phrygians, that manatees were not mermaids after all, that manatees were not discernible, or that mermaids were not discernible. If manatees had too few mermaiden traits to count as good Phrygian mermaids, perhaps some other sea mammal does. But the sad forgeries to be found in turn-of-the-century junk shops, a few bones stuck together to look like a fish-woman hybrid, can only have been intended, intended to deceive those who wanted there to be mermaids, but who had not thought clearly enough what it was they wanted there to be. Another sort of dugong may be fascinating, like a colanquinth, but isn't magic. Oh, <clears throat> if the Loch Ness monster turned out to be a pleosior, a plesiosaur descendant, as Dawkins briefly imagines, that would at least be a new species. If it's an otter, or a family of otters, or a waterlogged tree, then there seems little point in crowing that Nessie is real 
even if all sightings and corresponding namings were the otters or the trees. Even if it is a plesiosaur, or if all sightings of the water horse were really of the presum presumably extinct giant beaver, the magic's gone. If that's the Loch Ness Monster, then the Loch Ness Monster does not exist. It seems much more likely that talk of the monster, which now has a tinge of romantic nationalism to it, was once on a par with other legends of Kelpies, water horses, and the Nakalavi. The lower part, uh, this is a quote from um, George Douglas's Scottish fairy tales as cited by Briggs. <clears throat> the lower part of this terrible monster, as seen by Tammy, was like a great horse with flappers, like fins about his legs, with a mouth as wide as a whale's. On him sat, or rather seemed to grow from his back, a huge man with no legs, and arms that reached nearly to the ground. His head was as big as a clue of Simmons, a clue of straw ropes, generally about three feet in diameter. And this huge head kept rolling from one shoulder to the other as if it meant to tumble off. But what to Tammy appeared the most horrible of all, the monster was skinless. This utter want of skin added much to the terrifying appearance of the creature's naked body, the whole surface of it showing only red, raw flesh, in which Tammy saw blood, black as tar, running through yellow veins, and great sinews, thick as horse tethers, twisting, stretching, and contracting, contracting, <clears throat> as the monster moved. Trying to find a zoological analog for this creature would be like deciding that the headless corpse which wandered the Aztec's hallucinatory forest, the hideous wound in its chest opening and shutting with the sound of a woodman's axe, was really a rare woodpecker. Even if some such ordinary event or creature was sometimes mistaken for the monster, we would still be no nearer an understanding of why people so mistook. Mention of the Nukalavi and the sinister habits of mermaids will remind us that Dawkins' gossamer-winged little persons are very unlike the fairies of tradition. Gossamer wings appear on the Lancre's Devils in 1612, but it seems to have been Pope, Alexander Pope, who made them whimsical. Quote, Some to the sun their insect wings unfold, waft on the breeze, or sink in clouds of gold." The Cottingley fairies, supposedly photographed in 1917, quote, seem the very model of the butterfly-winged, gauze-clad fairies of the children's magazine illustrations, uh, end quote, uh, again from Briggs. But that is exactly why, quote, every feeling revolts against believing them to be genuine, end quote. If they were, improbably, it can only have been a joke on the part of beings noted for their trickiness and powers of illusion. Rather as a being encountered in outer space, who says he's God, most certainly is not. So a fairy that allows itself to be photographed is no true fairy. Quote, fairyland is an invisible world within which the visible world is immersed like an island in an unexplored ocean, from Evans Wentz. That painty-winged, wand-waving, sugar-and-shake-your-head sort of imposters, as Kipling's Puck describes them, may also by now have their own sort of reality. They are not traditional fairies, any more than rare Lepidoptera. Fairies are big or small, vulgar brownies and boggarts, or elephant servants of the fairy queen, well-meaning or malicious. They are shapeshifters and illusionists, desperately curious about human lives and casually contemptuous of human morals. For some, this makes them damnable. Perhaps Yeats was right that fairies, the city, are too simple for us. Quote, 
It is one of the great troubles of life that we cannot have any unmixed emotions. There is always something in our enemy that we like, and something in our sweetheart that we dislike. It is this entanglement of moods that makes us old. If we could love and hate with as good heart as the city do, we might grow to be long-lived like them. Um, I'll do a part four.